and you start the day in such a positive, positive way. Um, you know, Monday's my favorite day of the week. I love waking up on Monday morning and knowing it's Monday. And I've always been that way. To see these people finish and to look at their body types, to look at their age, uh, to see them the day before and think that they're gonna do an Ironman, and they do, those people are, are amazing. And, and they are different as a result. They're changed as a result. And they do re realize you, you can do anything. So we are here today with Barry Siff. Uh, Barry has a ridiculously long resume, and I'm just going to touch on a couple of points here, and hopefully I get it right, Barry. Um, but Barry, in a former life, was in the corporate world. He, he left that and, uh, and got full-time into sports. He built a very successful uh, multi-sport business, 5430 Sports, uh, ultimately uh, sold that to World Trash Triathlon Corp in 2009. Um, he was uh, on USA Triathlon Board of Directors uh, for many years and president for five years. Um, been involved in uh, in International Triathlon Union, which means he's obviously involved in the Olympics, uh, which is pretty exciting stuff too. Um, today, he's uh, president or CEO of the USA uh, Team Handball, which is interesting. So, But he doesn't sit all of his time in the boardroom. And if you see any photos, I'll put a couple up. Uh, you, you'll see he is a super active guy. Uh, 75 marathons, um, been a triathlete since 86, 12 Ironmans. We'll get you to talk about that a little bit. Um, adventure expedition racing. Um, I'm not sure what this race is in Tibet. You can tell us a little bit about that. Uh, Leadville 100 mile run, which again, I've heard about it, but I, I wouldn't dare expose myself to that punishment. Um, just an all around super active, really positive uh, role model. That, that I just, I really wanted to get up here and, and be able to share with everybody. So Barry, thank you. Thank you so much for taking time for us today. I'm, I'm just so excited to have you here. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Uh, yeah, I like that idea of a role model because I like to inspire people and just, just to be active. You know, you don't have to do the, those crazy 100 mile runs or seven day expedition races with no sleep. Uh, just get out there, you know, and have, have some fun. Yeah, it's a, it, it helps to understand, uh, I think, kind of where people come from. Um, what what, what kind of drove you to, um, to really get invested in sport? Like th there's the, you know, the, the weekend um, uh, you know, racer or just uh, yeah. runner, but, but obviously you've gone to another whole degree, or, uh, degree at a different point in life, not obviously um, as important when you were young, maybe. Yeah. I think it's come, I've come to understand it a little bit better as I've gotten older. And I think it's just all about goal, being goal driven, you know, goal driven, just, just putting something out there and going for it. And which obviously translates really well into business and work or, or pretty much anything. I, I can't conceive of not having a goal. Uh, it, something in front of me. What, and, and like I say, whether it's business, family, sports. And so when you have goals and you achieve them, you know, then you got to do the next thing. So, um, yeah, it all started in like 1980 or 81, right around there, or 79. And I was a tennis player, which um, I was in high school and college, but I read about running and my boss was a runner and saw that you could do America if you could run five miles the Detroit free press newspaper said if you can run five miles you can do this marathon in three months they were the sponsor of the marathon so I just followed their program and that was it I was just I did a marathon after three months of training and and never played tennis again uh and then went on from marathons to all this other crazy stuff Yes, 75 marathons. I'm guessing you've traveled a little bit to do some of those. Yeah, you know, I, I stopped. I, I had written on my bio, whatever, 75, but there have been many since then. I don't know how many I've done. I, I don't keep track of those kind of things. But, um, yeah, I've traveled all over the world with all my races. You know, I've raced in, for, I think, every, yeah, every continent for sure, but probably 20 or 30 different countries. Uh, a lot of that was my adventure racing. Uh, which took us to some absolute crazy places. Uh, the Raid Galois was the, the race in uh, Tibet and Nepal, which that, was that, really that, amazing. Tell me what that is, because I do not know that one. And, and, but maybe you shouldn't tell me. 
No, I should, because there's a funny story to it. Uh, the Raid Galois, uh, Galois is a cigarette brand in Europe. And uh, they were the, the, you know, the main sponsor of this Raid series. And back in the, in the 80s and 90s, um, excuse me, I don't know if it started in the 80s, but definitely 90s and into the early 2000s, that was this incredible expedition race uh, of a multi-day, generally five to 10 days of a team of, of four or five who it involved every um, athletic discipline that doesn't involve a motor, non-motorized travel. So it could be anything from obvious, a lot of mountain biking, a lot of trekking slash running, uh, whitewater rafting, skiing, mountain climbing, rappelling off very high mountains, um, ice skating, skiing in the winter, orienteering, inline skating, everything. And you would do it nonstop. And if you had to sleep, um, you, you, you did it, but you had to force the team to all sleep and you did it maybe for anywhere between 15 minutes and an hour, hour and a half. Um, and you went to these incredible lands. The interesting thing about this sport is that's where Mark Burnett, the founder of Survivor and uh, The Apprentice and you know all these incredible shows, this was his first foray into reality television. He did the Raid Galois himself. And then he founded Eco Challenge. Mm -hmm. And that's how it all began. And that was his career. You know, we were doing his Eco Challenge year after year until he started Survivor. And once Survivor got so big, he stopped Eco Challenge. So yeah, that's the backstory of what this adventure racing was, but Tibet and Nepal was amazing. We started at like, I think 15,000 feet. We went up to 17. Um, I, I'll never forget doing one corner in the middle of nowhere and there's Mount Everest looking at it. Uh, yeah, I get goosebumps right now thinking about it. It was amazing. Yeah, it kind of makes Race Across America look pretty tame, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know the Race Across America folks there. Rick and his dad. I mean, they're, they're, that's an amazing event. But yeah, it's it's similar to the extent for the solo people um, who go continuously on very little sleep. But it's one discipline. This was this was incredible. This is what got me after I got retired in 1998 uh, by Conagra. Um, three months later, I was doing this kind of stuff with uh, two business partners. And just learning it all, I had never been on a, I didn't even own a mountain, I'd never been on a mountain bike, never had a rope around me or a harness. And in June of that year, I was doing an expedition race. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, um, that, yeah, it's a, I know when I got pulled a little bit into adventure racing or death racing, and, and I, it was immediately apparent how, how well I'd been cared for with, you know, running on paved roads, like doing, you know, organized <laughs> triathlons and things and things, out here in the wilderness and looking around and seeing like, Oh, here's some fresh grizzly prints and you know, oh, yeah. you're, you're miles from anybody. And that that's nothing compared to obviously where, where you got pulled to. Oh man, there were some, um, yeah, it was amazing sport, amazing experience on that. You know, in one race in Fiji, we were told ahead of time by Mark Burnett, uh, and then experienced it, that we would be the first white people ever seen by some of these villagers. And our team went into one of these villages uh, and we were at the point where we had to sleep. And one of the homes, it's not really homes, but where they lived, invited us in. And we all slept on their, the floor of their hut. And you know, we woke up to these, you know, dozen or more people just staring at us. And, you know, it was that kind of experience that just brought you alive, you know, it's just amazing. And it was amazing what you could accomplish as a team. And that was the other great thing about Eco Challenge and the Ray Gawa and this whole thing of adventure racing. You do it as a team. And so, you know, you'd be falling asleep, you'd be absolutely dead on your feet, but your teammates weren't. And so you had to keep continuing and they helped each other. It was, it was great. Yeah. It, um, you know, as you're talking there and I, I'm always, my world is about longevity, right? And yeah. what are the things that you're going to do to be successful? 
Yeah. And the parallels between endurance sport, and I think that's what really got me interested in endurance sport. And I'm probably like you, you kind of figured out, well, you know, my biomechanics and my, um, and my, my, my health, my fitness all kind of seem to lean that direction. So you go in places where you're successful, but yeah, the, this whole notion of you, you want to be part of a team, like t- doing it on your own, you, you know, the likelihood of success is, uh, or the challenge is so much more, yeah. but uh, yeah, it's a, uh, and so obviously the piece that, uh, that in all of these events, and again, in a team event is some planning, which I think, again, the parallels I see are, I, I remember, um, you know, Gordo, uh, sure. Yeah. So I remember I sent Gordo my, G- Gordo coached me for a while. Gordo Byrne. Gordo Byrne, yeah. yeah. Um, I sent him my um, spreadsheet that I had done because I'm an engineer, right? And, he's, and he, <laughs> <laughs> he yeah. forwarded on to one of the guys, just, I thought I'd seen it all or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. But, but those of us who like numbers and we like to plan and we like to kind of manage the odds, right? Uh, and, and, and that's with endurance. It's not about all out speed. It's about, how do you manage your pacing and the maturity? And I think that's where, where you know, endurance when you're 18 is much harder than when you're 28 and 38, where you've got a little bit more maturity under you, right? Yeah, I think that's a great observation, one that I probably wouldn't have thought about bringing up. But the fact was, our team was pretty significantly the oldest team in this sport of adventure racing. In 19, we, you know, we did it from 1998 till 2003. So about five years. And, you know, Liz Caldwell was my partner. He always had to have a co-ed team. You had to have a mix, gender. Liz and I ran the team. We lived in the same city in Fort Collins, Colorado, trained together and raced together. And we organized the teams for all these races. Um, And yeah, you you definitely uh, lean on each other. But the maturity of our team, I think, really helped us prevail. We definitely were not the fastest and not the most skilled, but we worked together really well and we didn't have the emotional clashes that other teams did. It's interesting. The Iron Man on television uh, is awesome, you know, to watch, but most people, and I mean most, uh, like the vignettes, the stories of the people who have overcome cancer or have overcome losing two legs or whatever it is, uh, because the emotions of the story, well, in Eco Challenge, they would follow teams. And the stories were always the teams that fought and yelled at each other and would, you know, say to one of their teammates, okay, we're leaving you. You know, you're, we're done with you. And, you know, that was good TV. But the reality was most of those teams did have clashes. Our best races, uh, and we had several really, really good races, our team loved each other. And we would have different teammates. Liz and I would select, based on the race and based on the disciplines, who we would bring on our team. And and there was only one time where we really had, and I mean that, in five years, one time where we had a semi-clash on the team. Otherwise, we loved each other. And to this day, 20 years later, you know, we're all in touch. We and and what's else is amazing about longevity is most of these people are still doing some crazy things. I mean, they're still out there, you know, going up Everest. They're still out there rafting some of the biggest rivers in the world. They're still out there. You know, Mike Closure is the classic example of, you know, I don't know how old he is now, but he's doing everything. And so, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, that's all I've got to say. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, and I, I think you hit on a great point is, and it kind of ties back to what you said earlier and it just continues to get reinforced is that once you've done it, you realize what's possible and you want to do the next thing. Right? And it's a, um, yeah. and I go back and I look at, at uh, probably you, know, you and I have some corporate history again and these mm-hmm. gifts that get handed us or, you know, it takes way more courage to leap yeah. and leave. And that's where like, I feel, uh, uh, feel bad for kind of those stuck in corporate who just can't get out. Um, There's a lot of things that anchor people back from even trying. Um, And once you try once, then that's usually the biggest step, no matter what it is. You bet. I mean, you hear it all the time. You know, I do follow a lot of podcasts and a lot of books and read about success. You know, you're always looking for success tips, no matter how, you know, successful you may be. And, 
you know, oftentimes it is that, that it is that leap. And, and in my case, the leap was made for me. I mean, you know, Conagra decided to make a change in our executive team and came as, as a shock. Uh, but that night I was celebrating. I mean, literally, uh, I was senior vice president. Uh, I remember Kevin LaFleur, the president, and our wives, the four of us, went out and celebrated retirement at the age of four. I was 42. I think he was even younger. But he went back into the business. He's still in meatpacking and, uh, you know, working his butt off. And I just was able to to make that change. But it it, it is it is scary. And there are going to be, you know, everybody talks about the ups and downs. And um Fortunately, I haven't had that many downs, but you know, some curveballs, some bumps along the way. Uh, but yeah, it's. Um, I think it does take courage, but you've got to just have that confidence in yourself. And when you do accomplish things, like you said, once you accomplish something pretty large, you do realize what is possible. You know, Iron Man obviously has coined the phrase. I think they're the ones. Anything is possible. And when we sit, Jody and I uh, will watch Iron Man. Sometimes you know we live in Tempe, Arizona. So if I'm not racing Iron Man, Arizona, we can watch it. And you know we go to that finish line between the you know 12 and 15 hour people. And you know, to see these people finish and to look at their body types, to look at their age, uh, to see them the day before and think that they're going to do an Iron Man, and they do those people are, are amazing and, and they are different as a result. They're changed as a result and they do re realize you, you can do anything, you know, and I, I'll, I'll wear triathlon gear around the world and people see me in the airport and they'll say, Oh, so you do a triathlon, you do Ironman. Oh God, I wish I could. My answer is always the same as you can. I mean, pretty much anybody can do an Ironman. You got 17 hours, you, you just got to train. You just got to set a goal. You got to get people like Gordo, who, you know, or someone who coach you or read a book and, um, and set a plan and do it. And, and I think that's how all of us lead our lives. Those in endurance sports, we not only do it in endurance sports, we do it in business or whatever job we have, or even family, you know, we schedule things. Uh, but we're always looking for that next. And the only thing with aging is um, the slowing down is hard to, to uh, feel good about, you know, it's really, it's really hard uh, when you have a great race. Like I did a half marathon a, about a month ago and it was phenomenal. I felt fantastic. I thought my time was awesome. And I realized, I mean, I just how slow it is compared to, you know, you, you'll never PR again. You'll never have another PR ever. And that's, that's hard. That's hard. Yeah, and I think the uh, I think it's harder for um, so we're going to talk about with some other uh, other athletes. Um, I look to them and say that they've had an opportunity to retire already. So if you look at most um, pro athletes in almost every sport, yeah. they're going to face retirement in their 30s, and if they're lucky, maybe you're in their 40s, right. and they're going to have to reinvent themselves and go on to the next thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a um, if if your ego or your, your identity is all tied around um, that, but it's this, I'll say it's the exact same thing if, if for people in in corporate or in career. Yes, your identity is your business card. You're gonna you're gonna have some tough times ahead. You're gonna have to transition and reinvent, right? That is a a, a huge point, and and one that as president of USA Triathlon. Uh, together with Rocky Harris, our CEO, we, we in, in my, the last couple of years, focused a lot on that because we did see that. We started seeing, and now, of course, it's almost popularized, the, the athlete whose identity is being an athlete, um, once that's over, uh, invariably faces uh, challenging times, uh, you know, depression, uh, uh, challenges on what they're going to do. Uh, and I see that with Iron Man. I, I absolutely see it with Iron Man. There are, I, I can rattle off all kinds of people whose identity, I'm an Iron Man. You know, not only is it tattooed on their calf or their back or their arm or all, all the above, uh, but it's their identity. You know, what do you do? Well, I do Iron Man, you know. And, and God forbid if, if something ever happens and they're not able to do that, uh, I, I, would, I would worry about that. I think we've got to be larger than that. And, uh, 
you know, again, the podcasts and the thinking uh, and learning uh, ab about that issue has caused me to, to, to recognize what's really important in my life. And, you know, the sports is important. Endurance athletics is important, but it's not everything. You got to have a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you and I have been around that world. We, we recognize those individuals and, and for me, it's like, yeah, I'm, I feel bad for them because I know it's just a question of when, right? It's yep. like, yep. these are not things you can do forever or that you, yeah. that it's necessarily even healthy to do forever, or at yeah. least at any great frequency. It doesn't mean you can't do it in your eighties, yeah. um, but you don't want to be doing 10 Ironmans in your eighties as part of your life plan of just kind of keep on doing what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. It took me a while to realize that, you know, I can vividly remember Chris McCormick, Maca, the famous Ironman yeah. athlete, and uh, he was on the Today Show, I think, Good Morning America or Today Show, because some study had come out that said if you're training more than 12 hours a week, 12 hours a week, you're not benefiting your body. Um, up to 12 hours, you know, getting exercise is good for you, undoubtedly. Exercise is good for you. Being active is good for you. But once you hit that bell curve of 12 hours, it, it starts to take its toll on your body and maybe your mind, et cetera. And I listened to that and I thought, whatever, because I was training generally 15 to 18 hours a week for, for a long, long time. Now that I'm 65, I, I, I kind of beginning to understand that 12 hour number and the fact that I think, and I see it in people, in a lot of friends and colleagues, you know, when you, when you do this excessive exercise for a long, long time, probably does take its toll. I don't know scientific stuff, medical studies, probably takes its toll on your body and your mind, and you've got to keep it in check a little bit. Yeah, there's a, um, I think it's a balance, uh, particularly with endurance, maybe more than anything is around your immune system. Yeah. If if you keep running that down all the time and you're running on low, um, yeah. that's a good I, point. I think that's probably where your biggest vulnerability is, and unfortunately, there's no direct measure. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and I always uh, I've told people many times, you don't realize how fatigued you are until you actually take some time off and rest and realize after a few weeks of, oh, I've got a lot more energy than I did a few weeks you ago. Know, it's you, funny. you adapt, right? <laughs> It, it's funny you say that because you say take a few weeks off. So I was coached by someone, you know, whatever, 10 or 15 years ago, who I still follow a lot of his principles. And uh, one of his things, you know, you, you train every day, you don't take any days off. Uh, so I've gone years, many years with that philosophy, uh, no days off. And if you're really not feeling it for that particular workout, you still get your foot out the door. You still start the workout. And if you don't have it once you're out there, then you can turn around. Well, recently, very recently, um, once in a while, I'll take a day off, never weeks, never days, but a day off. And, and I really, I say to Jody, my wife, every single time that next day when I do my workout, wow, that was, that was a high quality workout. And so you realize that that rest, uh, even just for one day, makes a huge impact. I can't imagine taking three days off and then seeing what I would feel like on that fourth day. It would probably be amazing, but I, I yeah, I like, I, you know, it's part of my lifestyle. I don't consider it my identity. I just consider it my lifestyle. Like you get up in the morning, you have coffee, you do whatever, um, you know, you have dinner with your wife or your family or whatever. And, you know, I run or bike or swim or do, do something, you know, every day because that's just what you do, you know. Yeah, I, I get it. I, I live with that. My my wife is a runner because she just loves to run and it's yeah. a daily thing and she'll do a couple of marathons a week just running around the neighborhood. Yeah. Wow. Um, but wow. yeah, to take a day off with travel, you it's... <laughs> it's the travel, those travel days that, that sometimes, you know, if you're going overseas or whatever and you miss an entire day, but of course, as soon as you arrive, you get out there and at least walk or run. You know, the other thing you were mentioning a few a few minutes ago, I think what becomes really important as you get older, not only that, a little bit of recovery perhaps, but nutrition is, is huge. And I would say that's the biggest change that I've made in my 30 plus years of doing this stuff um, in the last couple of years. I really did recognize the impact of nutrition. You read about it, like nutrition, flexibility and strength training, all those things 
for years, 20, 30 years, I've said this year, I'm going to really focus on this. Um, but I have in, in terms of nutrition and I, ah, boy, that's, that's made a big difference. So what would you say, because we can break that down into, I think, are some really key elements, because like you, this is the thing we've all said, and we all seem to come up short because nobody's holding us accountable to it other than ourselves. Good point. Right. Um, So what would you say as the, because you grew up in the same era that I did, obviously, and, and we were told you can exercise yourself through just about any diet. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Largely. And I think of things that uh, has come out of the science now, it says, no, that's really not the case. Yeah. So yeah. what have you what have you shifted around nutrition? Maybe I've shifted question. pretty dramatically. You know, my wife's a vegetarian, gluten free, blah, 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 and has been forever. So, you know, I've watched that. Of course, my with Conagra, we ran the one of the largest meatpacking operations in the world. So I ate meat, you know. Uh, but, but I started thinking about this whole nutrition thing. And then two and a half years ago, uh, I listened to an amazing podcast with Lance Armstrong and Rip Esselstein and Rip is, uh, you know, former triathlete back in the eighties when I was, you know, getting into it and Rip was amazing and in the nineties. And so I recognized the name and then I real and, and, and they talked about his, you know, he's one of the leading people on plant-based diets and, I listened to it. I've always had a cholesterol issue. My brother's had a cholesterol. It's a family thing and a uh, pretty high cholesterol level and nothing, you know, I can do. I lead an incredibly good life, but my cholesterol was always high. And then I'm listening to this and he's talking about, you know, if you follow his steps, you know, go down. Then I'm flying over to Kona for the Ironman and two and a half years ago and I watched Forks over, Fork Over Knives, uh, the video. And it, and it just finally clicked. Everything my wife had been doing, Rip Esselstein talked about, and then this, this video. And so I got to Kona. I had my last uh, dinner at the Kona Inn, my favorite macadamia nut crusted uh, mahi-mahi. And I had it with, with uh, Rocky Harris, my, the CEO of USA Triathlon. I said, I'm done. No more meat, no more fish. Uh, dairy's going to be like crazily limited or non-existent. Uh, and I did it. I mean, I did it. And three months later, my cholesterol had dropped 40 points. It had never adjusted in my prior 30 years. And again, I didn't realize it, but I had achieved a goal. And I mean, that's all I needed because it said to me, you've crossed that finish line, uh, keep it up. And so I've remained pretty darn good since then. And uh, it's, it's also... You know, at that time I was napping most days. Jody and I, uh, two o'clock in the afternoon, would would lay down for 45 minutes every day. Uh, That stopped immediately. That week in Kona, of course, the excitement of Kona, you're not going to nap. But I, you know, didn't have to uh, take naps. I had more energy. Uh, I felt better. Uh, I, I, I leaned out a couple of pounds that has stabilized. And yeah, it's been a great, great experience. I'm not, you know, an evangelist on this. I don't push it on people, but I can tell you many examples, many examples of uh, people I've influenced in that direction that have thanked me 10 times over. Most recently, a very, very good friend in his 70s who is an Ironman world champion. And uh, I mean, he's won his age group in Kona and he was diagnosed with some heart issues and 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 cholesterol was an issue and i talked to him about you know what i'm doing he's thanking me big time his numbers have changed dramatically and his doctors have applauded his uh where he's gone yeah it's a um yeah in 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 the world of athletics i think it's it's one of the big moves that that we're seeing across the board Um, and for those who like data and we can measure something that's, I think, what, what, what you got and, and me as well was you can see a definite measure. You, people say, well, I feel more energy. Well, you lose a few pounds. Everyone says they feel more energetic because they feel right. better about themselves. But, right. but when you can get some blood work done and get a direct measure and you know as, as we get older, these are things we start to pay more attention to, right? What, what type of risk are we willing to, to bear? And you realize, well, I don't have to bear it. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't have to. I've got it. I've got the option. 
Um, the other is, which I've seen with people is, which it sounds like for you was really key was you, you made a decision, you went all in. It's, it's when you kind of stay half and half and just kind of that, that a lot of people want to do it in moderation. And, and while you may see some benefit, I think it's actually much easier and you invest. Uh, I tell people, I've never been so excited about food since I switched to plant-based. Like it's the opportunities, the flavors, the color. It's just like, I'm, I've never had more fun than I do, uh, do now. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I hear you. I didn't realize you were plant-based too. You know, I, yeah, I agree. I mean, when, when we have a meal that looks great, tastes great, feels great, you know, it kind of reminds me when I started juicing, we, we did juicing for quite a while. I've stopped that since, but um, I remember just saying, we're drinking health. We're drinking health. The other thing, what you just said reminded me of, we also did this thing um, during this period called Inside Tracker, which is, you know, blood work deal where you know you get it and you get blood work and then they analyze it and essentially you know do all the metrics for you uh and tell you your your age based on your blood work and i'll never you know i ended up so my wife is like eight or nine years younger than me and she's super healthy but after the blood work i actually came up a bit younger than her uh and it was pretty much off the charts i forget i remembered i was like 47 or 48 quote unquote years old when I was really almost, I think I was almost 60 or 57 or 58. And uh, we're getting ready to do that again now because it's just, you know, it's like getting a medal around your neck. It's just like getting a finisher's medal or not quite going down Elite E Drive, but it's pretty good feeling when you, when you know that your body's working properly and you're feeling good, you know, and I've, I've been blessed with, you know, great health through this whole thing. Uh, I've never, you know, I haven't had any, any serious injuries, haven't had to stop. Um, only one time way back in the 80s when I was uh, working, I was vice president of a corporation. Uh, I was running marathons on a regular basis. And then I decided to go to law school at night because I thought, you know what? That would be really cool to, to get a law degree. Well, that pretty much did it. And I ended up, my foot was in a walking cast for uh, a bit of time. And then I stopped this whole law thing. But um, sometimes you can push it, push the limit. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 we all have a tank, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I realized you, you got to realize when you've gone too far and that was, that was too far. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, that takes a lot of, a lot of energy. It's crazy. So, so if I kind of look forward to, I mean, uh, you've touched on it, uh, Maybe, maybe kind of circling back, one of the things I think that that's really important for people to know is all the different type of events that you know once once we get to our age, it's certainly not a, a question of you know all the opportunities have gone by, right? Yeah. Um, have you been involved in masters, any of the masters events at all, or I, I know I, you're a little young yet, maybe to be jumping into that? Yeah, yeah, I haven't. I haven't, and I'm not sure again, psychologically whether I could unless I felt like I could win, you know, I, I, I know people who, you know, Dave Albo is a, a friend in Boulder and I know he's a great track runner and he goes to these masters events and I think he has a shot at winning or a, setting a national record. That would be cool. I don't think of my, you know, I really don't think of myself in those terms. I, and it's not like I try to think of myself that I'm still in my thirties. I just don't think of myself in my sixties or seventies. Like what's really bugging me now, I, I'm, I'm actually turning 65 in June. I'm getting all this Medicare stuff in the mail every day. That tells you you're old. Uh, and, and I kind of ignore it. I don't know. I, I still haven't dealt with it. So, I, yeah, the long, short, long answer is I haven't done a master's event. Uh, the only corollary is w when you do age up in, in triathlon, so now I'm at the bottom of my age group, that is a huge incentive huge incentive so now you know I'm, rather than competing with 60 year olds i'm competing with 65 to 70 year olds i guess that's kind of a master's competition within a competition yeah i think there's all kinds of varieties and really where i was going with that was that for those of us if we have the uh, if we can afford to travel to a destination right there's all sorts of destination events i i know i'd looked at uh, doing something in australia and okay. it wasn't and uh, and i well i'd qualified for the um uh, for the worlds in uh, in Olympic uh, triathlon when they were in France, 
Oh yeah, yeah, and, for sure. Indeed. And it really had. I thought nothing about the race was, what am I going to do when I go to France? <laughs> oh, my God, absolutely. So with USA Triathlon, you know, to get on Team USA in your age group, those are amazing events. I mean, I've been to those for the last several years, you know, the Gold Coast of Australia or Nice, France or, or wherever it is. You know, this year it's in Edmonton, uh, Canada. And, yeah, those are great opportunities to go see beautiful places and compete with people your age and – and uh, just new experiences. You know, I always said to my kids, and I continue to say, life's all about experiences. And uh, that's, I think, a, a statement that's kind of defined what I've done. And I think what hopefully will inspire other people to do, just do, do different, different things. Yeah, it's, um, well, again, with a background in multi-sport, you recognize the value yeah. of doing different things, right? Of, yeah. uh, you know, I'll give, give you another another side note. I sit in my office here in Tempe and I overlook Tempe Town Lake, uh, which I'm looking at right now. Uh, and every morning, at, like I get up between 4.30 and 5 a.m. every day. And that's still within my, my life. That's the way it's always been. And I go out, I have my coffee and I go out on our deck and I look at the crew, people in, you know, boats uh, rowing out there at 5, 5.30 in the morning in the dark. And I mean, not only does that inspire me so much, uh, which it does, but it shows me all these different things you can do. You know, my wife and I just started stand up paddling this past year, totally new, different, great exercise and great for the mind. Uh, yeah, there's so much different stuff to do. And uh, yeah, every, everything's out there and you just got to do something. Just got to stay active. Yeah, and I think we've seen that with popularity in certain sports has, has kind of shifted, right? We've seen some grow and some have kind of matured and uh, people are fighting to hang on to them almost. Yeah. But, it, but it's okay, I think, that uh, ch change is ultimately good. Yeah, it is. It is. You know, I had to deal with that when I was in triathlon, you know, helping lead USA Triathlon. We, I was there during the color run days when all of a sudden color run exploded, CrossFit exploded. And all of a sudden we looked and triathlon wasn't growing anymore. And we were like, what's happened? And we realized there were just more fun choices, different choices. That's leveled off, triathlon's back rising and we're doing great, but um, it's just doing something different. I mean, that's why I'm doing handball. Uh, I, think, I think handball is an incredible sport, this team handball in the Olympics. And, you know, getting involved in that, even though I'm not physically playing handball, probably won't, but I, who knows, but it's just doing something different. And, uh, you know, you guys, you got to shake it up, mix it up. Don't get in a rut. So, so if I kind of look forward to say, uh, where's Barry going to be in 10 years? What, what, what do you think you might uh, look back and tell us? I, yeah, I have no idea, but it's going to be fun. Uh, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be big. Uh, it's going to be different than anything else. But I don't know what it's going to be. I mean, I have no idea. It's probably not going to be base jumping, but but, but uh, it could be. It could be Ram. It could be riding across America at 75 years old. I don't know. Solo. It would be solo. Uh, I have no idea. You know, it could be writing another book or two. I've, all, I've still wanted to write, there are a couple books in my mind that still want to write, but uh, it won't be small. It will be big uh, and uh, it'll be fun, you know, but I don't know what it's going to be. And it won't be 10, you know, I seem to have these five year blocks of life. When I look at my successful achievements, it's in fives. So I'm already thinking, you know, what's, what's going to happen in, in, in three or four years for me professionally. And, um, also athletically, it's, it'll, it'll be something different. It, it won't be retiring on a golf course. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. T yeah. Th there's a sport that's struggling. <laughs> really struggling, yeah. uh, really struggling. And I listened to a, a, a presentation a couple of weeks ago that once again, you know, the, that professional side, you know, always used to be, and I was part of that back when I was with, uh, with Conagra and another organization you know, Saturday morning, you did your golf game with your fellow colleagues and executives. It was a business kind of deal. And and then cycling became that new golf, they said. And now they're saying triathlon is the new golf. You get out there and you go for a run or a bike or whatever. And, and a lot of uh, Silicon Valley money 
and other money and investors and everything, when you when you look at it, they are running or they're biking or they're swimming. And when you know the CEO challenges or executive challenge, whatever you call it at Ironman now, uh, very successful people doing triathlon and, and business is being done in that way, I think a lot more as well as golf today. Uh, and that, that's a pretty cool thing to think about. Yeah, it, 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 uh, it fits for me, or I think what drew me in was you didn't have to be great at any one thing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it was more about understanding balance. And if I pull it back to longevity, that's one of the things I try to coach people is don't focus on any one area too much. Like to be perfect in what you think is perfect nutrition at the expense of everything else. That's that's not going to be the recipe for success. And multi-sport, I think, is a great great yeah. living example of that. Scott, that's a that's a great point. Uh, today in my life, that thing called balance is something I'm. I think I used to be really really good at, and 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 I you know I think that has contributed to my longevity in in business and in, in life and and in um, and in sports. Uh, but right now I'm dealing with a balance issue i'm working way too much uh, uh way way too much when i do get up at 4 30 within 15 minutes i'm on my computer dealing with emails or i'm on the phone with people in europe uh and and i'm feeling the effects of that there's absolutely no doubt about it uh balance is huge and i you know you always hear about it everybody talks about it um and you like nutrition you go yeah 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 this is the first time in my life, first time in my life I've reckoned, even though I've worked, you know, I used to work way too much uh, when I was working. And, and you know, if you're going to be an executive in a big company, you're going to work a lot. That's all you, know, you are. But I never thought, it, you know, it was OK. I, now I'm realizing it might not be OK. And I don't think it's just related to age. I just think you, you've got to have that balance. I'm trying to figure that out right now. Yeah, I can. Well, I can relate when you're in, when you're doing something you really love. Yeah. Right. And you feel like you're making a difference. Um, there's a different driver that's there. Yeah. Um, and turning it off is not as easy as, as you might think. But but yeah, it's exactly. uh, and, and we're old enough now to recognize when we're out of balance and, and we know we need. You know, but while it's while there's some healthy tension there, we know we need to kind of tug on it and kind of work through whatever and not, yeah. not just fill it in with the next crisis that showed it up in our inbox. Right? You, you get it. You get it. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm right there with you. Well, well, I think that's great, Barry. I, I, I'm just so excited that you took some time for us to kind of dive in here. And I think, you know, you've been such a great motivation to people you, you will never meet. Um, but hopefully this will get out to a few more people that'll, that'll get to know who you are and, and, and about the kind of life you've lived and the life that you're living, obviously, yeah. which I think is ultimately really important to be able to show people that this is real. I really appreciate it. And I can tell you're in the, you're in the same way and, uh, appreciate you sharing those stories with people. It's, it's important. I think the only thing we haven't mentioned is just the fact that a lot of people that we see out there at our age and, and doing whether it's Ironman or marathons or whatever start later in life. Uh, the classic one, of course, is Sister Madonna Buder, who's still out there at 89 years old. 89 years old. She's totally, my favorite of all. Favorite total, of all. Oh, yeah. say totally lucid. Uh, Jody and I are blessed to have her as a very, very good friend. We communicate regularly. She stayed with us, and you know, many times she's come to our events in Boulder. And, uh, and she didn't start until her mid fifties, uh, when she, you know, went out and ran a little bit. Now she's still doing triathlon, still say, you know, asking me technical questions about the sport. And do you think I can do this race, et cetera, 89 years old. But, but the point being, she started later and there are plenty of people now, you know, who are stepping out and realizing it's, it's, it's good to get out there and you can start at any age just got to be careful and smart that's all yeah which and i mentioned to you i think that what pulled me into triathlon wasn't weren't the young bucks it was the retired uh, accountant and uh, yeah. uh I forget whoever else one of the feature stories and, and thinking wow you know th they've got a lot more years and they didn't do it their whole career what's Correct. my excuse i don't have one uh, yeah so get yeah. out and i'm so thankful for for having done that it uh it absolutely. So I didn't start multi-sport to my forties and, but it okay. totally, I didn't realize how long I'd been looking for it. And once I found it, it was like, 
I have, I found my tribe. I found yeah. uh, h- how I can live a lifestyle that, uh, that really helps me uh, do the yeah. other things I want to do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, positivity is another word I use a lot. And I think that comes out of, out of this, you know, you just feel good. You're positive about things. You're accomplishing something every day. I listened to someone just yesterday talk about this 2020 rule. And, you know, this, he preaches about waking up and doing 20 minutes of something active and then 20 minutes of something more mindful. Uh, and, and yeah, I think that's a good way to start it. You know, just, just being active and, and, and feeling that. And all of a sudden you have this mind shift and you start the day in such a positive, positive way. Um, you know, Monday's my favorite day of the week. I love waking up on Monday morning and knowing it's Monday. And I've always been that way. Always been that way. With Conagra, I did most of my travel on Sunday nights. So they could hit the road, you know, running on, on Monday. Uh, yeah, anyway, that's all. <laughs> yeah, no, very cool. Very cool. Well, thank you very much, Barry. I um, it, It's going to be fun to follow up follow where you go with handball and see how, how that success uh, hopefully translates uh, into, yeah. into some, some U S success stories. Yeah. I, I'm confident it will. We're on the right track. And in, in the last 10 or 11 months, it's been an incredible adventure and journey and making some great progress. And if you haven't, uh, if, if anyone watching this hasn't, hasn't seen handball, it's amazing. Go to USA team handball.org and check it out. You know, it's a great, great sport and America deserves it. Oh, that, that's awesome. Well, good, good luck with it. Good luck getting the balance back on. Uh, thanks, Scott. I appreciate that. Yeah, and, uh, and hopefully we'll connect up down in Tempe one day when I get my bike down there. I've been down there a few times. but Yeah, uh, we'll, give me a shout. We'll make it happen. Okay, Thank you have a much. great day, Barry. Thanks so much again. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.